equations can be put in. Okay. Let's talk about factoring. Factor that for me. It's one thing you can never get too much practice in, and that's factoring. Mm -hmm. I agree. So x and x. Hold on. I made a mistake. Uh, that was supposed to be a 3. Hold on. You know, that would have been tough to factor right there. You would have had, yeah. to, use, you would have had to use the quadratic the way I wrote it. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you can't factor something, then you have to use the quadratic formula. And you said in the, the different formats, there's only one format for the quadratic formula. Well, the, not the quadratic formula, like quadratic equations. So vertex ah, okay. Form, uh, okay, yes. Factor. yes. They are, this is kind of the standard format. Is yeah, when you have standard. everything on one side and you set it equal to zero, the way to solve that quadratic is to factor. And then you'll have two things multiplied together that are equal to zero. Then you can state that one of these has to be zero. Mm -hmm. So what's the factor of this? So x and x. Negative, positive. Five and two. Five goes with the largest, or the largest factor goes with the sign of the middle term. Okay. Um, let me just do one other easy one. Oh, by the way, I got a big map back today. I got a 94. Good for you. How about this one? X and X. Positive, positive. 25 and 1. Alright. Now we'll get just a little tougher. So I have no doubts that you can do first degree ones. First degree is what I call anything that starts like that. Okay? Well, let's yeah, let's not get beyond that quite yet. Let's do one of these. In other words, when there's not a middle term with x, but more than that, this actually has a name. What's the name of this? Um, difference of perfect squares. Okay, how's it factor? Um, x plus five, x minus five. All right. So that's kind of the second quadratic. Now, notice something about this quadratic. The fact that it doesn't have an x term, if I was solving an equation, in other words, if that was the equation, well, now I don't need to factor it as difference of perfect squares. I can do this. And what's the next step here? Um, just square root. And so what do you get as an answer? X is plus or minus 5. Yeah, which is the same answer we got when we treated it as difference of perfect squares. Remember, it was X minus 5 times X plus 5, which gives you plus or minus 5 as an answer. It's almost better to treat it as difference of perfect squares as opposed to the way I just did it. And that's because half the people will forget that plus or minus. And they'll come up with x equal 5. Whereas if you do it by difference of perfect squares, you always get it correct. Mm How -hmm. do I solve that? Subtract the 11. 
Well, I can do it that way so that then I have a quadratic that looks like this. Is that factorable? No. Okay, so I can still do it. In other words, I can do it how at this point? Quadratic formula. Yeah. You know how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's actually a third way of doing this. In fact, it's where the quadratic formula came from. It's called completing the square. How do I complete the square here? I'm assuming this is probably the third way you were talking about. Um, this is a fairly important step in algebra, actually, because it's not just for quadratics that you have to complete the square. It's for a lot of things. It's for parabolas. It's for ellipses. It's for hyperbolas. It's for circles. Uh, it's for vertex format of quadratics. You have to be able to complete the square. How do you complete the square here? What's the process? Uh, honestly, I have no clue. Okay. I have that. First of all, you'll notice that as long as the x squared and the x term are grouped together with no constant, well, I can always do stuff like, well, how about if I add 9 to that and add 9 to that? Okay? I can do that, right? Yeah. Why did I add 9? Well, the number that I want to add should be half of that number squared. All right. The reason is, is that it then allows me to write this as x plus 3 quantity squared. That's equal to 20. All right? Now, mm -hmm. I can take the square root of both sides. and subtract 3. So I end up with x, excuse me, the square root of both sides leaves a plus or minus there. So I end up with minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 20. Now the square root of 20 is the same as 2 root 5. So let's simplify that. You see where it's the same as 2 root 5? Isn't it 4 root 5? Oh, yeah, 2 root 5, yeah. It's square root of 4 times square root of 5, which comes down to 2 root 5. Okay? Now, this looks a lot like an answer that I would have gotten if I would used the quadratic formula, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't. But I got the same answer. And that's because the quadratic formula was, they arrived at that by completing the square. In other words, the completing the square process was known long before the quadratic formula was. And they came up with it by completing the square starting with standard format. Just, in other words, if standard format is this, and it is, that's called standard format. And I can't tell if it's going to factor or not until I know what A, B, and C are. But I can still complete the square. How would I complete the square? Well, let's leave our x squared term. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to tell you how I would start it. And now, in order to complete the square, you have to make sure that the coefficient of the x squared term is 1. So you have to factor out the A leaving that. In other words, the key for these is to never change it. This line right here should be the same equation as that, and it is. Okay. Now, how did I complete the square? I took half of that and squared it and added it. So half of that is b over 2a squared is b squared over 4a squared. 
and I have to add that amount to my other side. You can kind of see where we're going here. In other yeah. words, we're going to end up with x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. In other words, okay. this you could always recreate. I was watching a poker program once where one of the guys had a PhD in math and one of the contestants said, do you, do you know the quadratic formula? And he says, no, I don't memorize it because I know I can always create it. I can always come up with it. And what he meant was he can always take the standard format and complete the square and come up with the quadratic formula. And that's true. That's how they came up with it. Too bad they don't have a quadratic formula for cubics. Yeah. Have you had, have you tackled cubics yet? Not yet. We just got into this new unit. Well, let me just talk about cubics for two seconds. That's a cubic, right? Yeah. We don't know how to factor cubics. There is no cubic formula. There's a very, very complex method for doing it, for trying to figure out what the zeros are. And I mean complex. You're going to crack when you find out how hard it is. We wish there were a cubic formula. However, the one thing you can always do, the very first thing you should always look for, what's that stand for? Greatest common factor. Okay. Can I take a greatest common factor out of this? You can take an X. Ah, that reduces it to a quadratic. And that's the key with a lot of these cubics that you'll end up getting. In other words, now I don't have a cubic. I have a quadratic. And whether that can be factored or not, I think it can, actually. In other words, I accidentally came up with one. Factor that for me. This is a little harder to factor. Start. 2x and that. Okay. Both signs. Um, positive. It's only one set of factors of 5, and that's 5 and 1 must be the, ah, not quite. Not quite. That would give you 7x in the middle. What I must have been thinking about was, I must have thought that was a negative sign. If I change that to a negative sign, now, well, and I'd have to change that to a negative sign. And now, minus 5 plus 1 gives you minus 3x in the middle. Yep. It's very hard to come up with quadratics in your head that are what I call second-degree quadratics. Not because there's a 2 in front of the x squared, because there's a number other than 1. In other words, if I put a 4 there, that would also be a second-degree quadratic. They're just much, much harder to factor. They basically become a trial and error process. And so it's, it's very difficult for me to think up a quadratic that's a second degree one that um, actually factors nicely. It's, it's really a hard thing to do mentally. Uh, and so... Usually what I do is I go in a book and I look for quadratics that are second degree or harder. Um, the process, whenever you're dealing with a second degree quadratic, let's just take it again, the way I meant to write it. Now, Factoring this really is not that different than factoring an elementary quadratic. You still break up this 
to 2x and x. We still know the signs have to be opposite. The difference is, in this case, you have to allow for both, plus minus and minus plus, because they're not going to be the same. In other words, as long as this coefficient is different than this coefficient, here, I don't know if you can tell me pointing that, as long as this coefficient is different than that coefficient, then if the signs are opposite, you have to account for both. And it could be plus 5 and 1, or it could be the 5's down here and the 1 is over there. Well, how do we determine? Like I said, it's a trial and error. Let's try this one first. And does, in other words, at this point, I'm merely trying to prove, does this multiply together to give you that? And it does. Yeah. And the way you always check it are these double smiley faces. These double smiley faces are not just a method for checking your quadratic. They're a very helpful method for figuring out what the factors are. Because what you always are looking for is for that middle term to be right. Well, when I add the product of the inside and the outside, I get minus 3x. And that's what I got here. Now, had I started like this, in other words, I don't know where to start. When I say trial and error, I mean you just kind of have to try it and see if it works. Okay. Well, if I would have started like that, I would have got plus 5x minus 2x. Well, that would have given me plus 3x. Right number, wrong sign. Right? I'm trying to produce a minus 3x. Yes. So I immediately know that if I move my 5 down to the negative and the 1 down to the positive, I'm going to get the same number, different sign. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, I'll have the solution. But let's say... I put the 5, the 1, let's say I started there. Now, when I do the inside and outsides, I get plus 1x minus 10x. That's minus 9x. I don't get the right number. I don't get a 3. And that's a clue that it, it, moving the 1 down to here and the 5 down to there this is going to give you a 9 again, only it'll be a different sign. It'll be a plus 9. Okay? So that's very helpful. It means that we've eliminated having 1 on the left and 5 on the right. And that's what factoring these is all about, is eliminating what doesn't work. What I know is I have to have the 5 on the left and the 1 on the right. And then I quickly find out that I have to have the 5 down here and the 1 down there. And so I get to my answer, but it's not easy. Um, they may have taught you something called the California method or the diamond method or something. Yeah, the California method. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not doing really anything different than the California method. The California method has a bunch of trial and error built into it. Um, you just kind of have to look for the right combination of factors that produce this middle term. But it's all about producing that middle term. And I get the middle term only by multiplying that together, that together, and adding those two results. That's where the middle term comes from. All right. Cool. I got to run. And we'll talk good. next Monday. Sounds good. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.